the times that we live in are characterized by abundance. They're equally characterized by fear. Abundance in relation to how we inhabit the planet and partake of what it offers, and fear in relation to the likelihood that the way in which we inhabit this world, that this abundance is destroying the very conditions of possibility that make human life possible. Now, it is this combination of abundance and fear that has now found articulation in the epithet, the Anthropocene. If the Anthropocene and its intertwined features of abundance and fear constitute a key concern of our times, then how have and how might the arts, humanities, and social sciences respond to them? Scholarly responses to the Anthropocene can be seen as falling into two broad categories. The first strand is made up of what I call Elon Musk versions, visions of the future, those that involve dreams of re-engineering this planet and the colonization of new worlds after we've laid to, worst, laid, laid to waste Earth. This first strand, in my eyes, is at best overly optimistic and at worst deeply problematic. A second, more ethically oriented strand focuses on highlighting the close entanglement of the lives and vulnerabilities of the different beings, human and other, that share this world. It explores how we can tread more lightly on the planet. So in some ways, one can say that the Anthropocene has generated much interest in how the ambit of the human sciences, the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, can be expanded to include the rest of the world, the more than human. The more than human turn incorporates vital interventions, but in this talk, I would like to argue for a renewed focus on the human as a necessary response to the Anthropocene. I suggest that the abundance and fear that characterize this era are closely tied to a particular vision of the human and of human well-being. As such, the task of resituating humanity in the world becomes crucial in constructing possible futures. And what better field than the human scientists with their long histories of theorizing the human to undertake this task? So why do I say this? If we take a step back and look at all the big nature-related problems in the Anthropocene, it becomes very clear that very little of it is linked to malevolence. Whether climate change, biodiversity loss, air pollution, or factory farming, none of them stem from bad intentions, ill will, or the desire to do harm. Rather, they are all the offshoots of efforts to do good through the pursuit of development. And it is not just nature-related problems that are the counterparts of developmentality, but also a whole range of social justice issues. There is now much social action and associated research on the pernicious impacts of the pursuit of development on vulnerable people, impacts that have striking parallels to impacts on vulnerable nature. Now, this is not anything new. Since the establishment of the World Commission on Dams in 1997, it is widely accepted, even by conservative organizations such as the World Bank, that the development, projects, that the development project in its various manifestations has significant negative impacts on vulnerable people and obviously on nature. And yet, the pursuit of such harmful development has continued and has been justified in the name of the very same people that it harms. Now let us set aside nature for a minute. What might be the basic end goals of development? What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you, one, one asks, why is development done? What, why is development done? Improvement. Improvement of? Uh, people's livelihoods, capital, growth, sometimes just progress for progress sake. Any other thoughts? Profit money. Mm -hmm actually go to the end, the more, at the most basic level, development is done to promote human well-being, right? That's why we do development. That's why we want to improve livelihoods. That's why, it's, that's why we want profits, right? It's all about enhancing human well-being, right? So how is it that something that is meant to promote human well-being ends up harming people, both directly and indirectly by harming nature? To understand this, I'd like to direct attention to the vision of human well-being that lies at the heart of developmentality. It is a vision of a good human life as something that, A, involves the maximization of a range of capacities that are considered to be uniquely human, and more fundamentally, that involves insulation from the threats and vagaries posed by non-human nature, including death itself. Even the most 
most basic of development indicators, that of like life expectancy, is predicated on the human capacity to circumvent the risks that are inherent to living as part of the more than human world of being animal. So embedded in this quest for an insulated and protected life is an ever increasing degree of consumption, material and otherwise, aimed at enhancing comfort and pleasure and rendered possible by the use, exploitation and redesign of non-human nature. The idea of human well-being that underpins developmentality is in many ways the ultimate expression of human exceptionalism. Human exceptionalism, which might be a term familiar to many of you here, combines ontological and ethico-political claims. Ontological claims about the uniqueness of human beings are bound up with claims about the ethical superiority of human beings over all other life forms. These claims have over time been supported by zoopolitical logics, wherein perceived differences in various capacities and traits between humans and other animals have been used to make ethico-political distinctions between human and non-human life. Now, the zoopolitical logics of ex human exceptionalism play a key role in the pursuit of human well-being via development by rendering non-human life killable. Right? However, this is not the only role that the zoopolitical machine has in developmentality. Development discourse and practice equally deploy zoopolitical thinking in the domain of the social, the intra-human. The idea of human well-being embedded in developmentality goes along with the zoopolitical relegation of those peoples and ways of life that do not meet the benchmarks of development as inferior and as a need of the improving care of development. It relegates as inferior those human ways of life that are less insulated from the risks posed by nature and those that are not predicated on the pursuit of consumption, surplus accumulation and an ever expanding definition of basic needs. With other animals, zoopolitical logics may be centered on rationality or morality or language or some other cognitive capacity. With other humans, it is some other trait, such as a lack of a particular kind of education or access to a particular kind of housing. So development is ultimately about the pursuit of exceptional exceptionalism. It is about maximizing human exceptionalism with the recognition that all human communities are capable of being developed into a particular form of human flourishing, even if only a few are actually there at this mo moment. So development is about cultivating abundance, about amplifying those human features that are believed to be maximally different from other species, creating institutions that maintain that distinction, and about pushing forward and uplifting those communities and societies that do not meet the vision of human well-being that underlies developmentality. And it is in the pursuit of this vision of humanity as Superman that the development project makes use of, exploits, and destroys the rest of nature. In other words, the most troubling social and more than human concerns of our times are tied closely to a positive vision of what humans are and how their well-being can be achieved. It is this positive vision that drives all those activities that have worrying implications for the very conditions of possibility for human life on the planet. It is this positive vision that underlies both the abundance and the fear that characterize the Anthropocene. Now, this makes the task of responding to the Anthropocene much harder. Those activities that have caused the Anthropocene are geared towards pursuing a good. They are geared towards pursuing a particular vision of human well-being. As such, it becomes futile to challenge those activities without querying the vision of humanity that they are directed by. Indeed, critical scholarship on human exceptionalism and the Anthropocene has devoted much attention to reconfiguring systems of ethics and politics to make space for the more than human. But generations of scholarship and social action suggests that it is not enough to shore up the more than human, or indeed lesser humans, to meet the standards of human exceptionalism. Such reconfiguration remains incomplete and ineffective without also revisiting the human. It is here that lies the key task of the arts, humanities, and social sciences of the near future, to query and reconstruct long entrenched ideas about what human beings are and what their well-being entails. More specifically, I wonder if what is needed is the dismantling of the human, a replacement of the human in the rest of the world. How might the human sciences approach this task? 
We might start by asking what it means to live as nature, as animals, taking these questions beyond the confines of some tiny niches of philosophy. In the Anthropocene, it is widely accepted that there are no strict divisions between society and nature. Everything is social nature. And yet, most scholarship and activism on this subject retains a vision of human well-being that rests on zoopolitical logics. It remains unimaginable that humans should live like the rest of nature, with shorter lifespans perhaps and unsupported by the infrastructures of medicine and engineering that currently insulate many communities from the risks and vulnerabilities that are inherent to being a part of nature. If anything, existing notions of human well-being require the upliftment of those who are less insulated from nature to meet the norms and standards of those who are more insulated. Existing notions of humanity and of human well-being require that variations within humanity to be smoothened out by bringing the fruits of development and the norms of human exceptionalism to everyone everywhere. So how can we invert this logic so as to relocate those humans who lead the most insulated lives instead of displacing others in trying to uplift them. The degrowth movement in some ways tries to do this by focusing on the economies and lifestyles of the non-poor instead of trying to develop the poor. And I wonder what might happen if these ideas are pushed further. On a practical everyday level, what might it look like if we abandoned exceptionalist visions of the human and replaced people as nature? It might mean that I stop using flea medication on my cat or head lice medication on my daughter. It might mean that I stop benefiting from all those animal lives that have been sacrificed at the altar of biomedicine. It might mean that I learn to cohabit with rats, tigers, elephants, cockroaches, gulls, wolves, and pigeons instead of expecting far off rural communities in India or Zimbabwe to protect wildlife. It might mean that I stop viewing human life as somehow more not killable than other animal life. I've struggled with these thought experiments, for they are very far from how we have been schooled to think about ourselves and the other beings that share our species identity. So I will conclude with a set of questions. Is it at all possible to re-situate the human in the rest of nature? Is it possible to reconceptualize human well-being to bring it into closer alignment with the well-being of the other creatures that, we in that inhabit the planet? And in doing this, how can the existing differences within humanity be taken into account? These are questions that are simultaneously ontological, epistemological, and ethical, and are questions for the human sciences of the near future and for all of us in this room. Thank you.